So where did your passion for making a career with your instrument start? I remember riding around with my dad and his like, he had a 1972 Ford truck and, you know, it was like AM radio. So back then, you know, AM radio would play, you would hear like a Billy Preston song. And then the next thing you know, you'd hear like a, a rock song, you, you know, because back then you had to buy records. And if you weren't buy, if you didn't have the money to buy a bunch of records, you know, radio was your format. I was, uh, I'd started banging around on the piano when I was like five or six and then took, took piano lessons. And, and, and at that early age, I just, I knew I was like, Hey man, I'm, this is what I want to do. I don't know how this is going to happen. You know, I didn't know anything about being a studio musician or how that went. All I knew is I, I wanted to play music, try to make money at it. Um, and, and that to be my life, even at a young age. Did you did you have an interest in being an artist at, at any point, or was your focus on being an instrumentalist? Uh, I loved being in a band. I loved doing that with other people because I was classically trained on the piano, and, and I remember playing like recitals and and or doing the like a competition where you go and you play for a judge, mm -hmm. and if you do well, they invite you back to honors recital mm -hmm. where you play on a stage in front of you know mainly parents and. And man, I remember being so nervous because right. I'm up there and I would do great. But I mean, I remember literally like wanting to to just uh, you know, throw up or, or get, you know, my parents having to come get me out of the room to go do it. Being the guy, the main guy, that's, you know, that it always, it always, I was frightened of it for some reason. I didn't have the confidence yet for that. And and I don't know, I was great at, at supporting other people and and I got joy out of that. And and, mm -hmm. and I knew it's like, hey, I can still write songs and I can still go do, you know, shows on my own and do that. But I don't know. It just seemed like a lot of pressure to me. Your first, um, like, professional gig was that Kenny Wayne Shepherd? Yeah. So how did that come about? Well, that came about because I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana. And Kenny's father was a radio personality. He was a program director at a pop station. I had started college at LSU, but I was playing in bands, wanted to do music. There was no music program at LSU. So I went there for one semester and I was miserable. I hated it. So I found a college called Middle Tennessee State University, <laughs> right around the corner, MTSU, mm -hmm. that had a recording industry management program. So I said, I got to, you know, do something in music for college or just get the hell out and don't do college. I ended up going there for a couple of years, but that first semester, I had a good semester there. And then I went home. Um, for a summer and and I met uh, Ken Shepard and his son who was like 15 at the time he was Kenny Wayne Shepard every Monday night there was this bar called Shooters <laughs> and they had a blues jam and Ken Kenny's dad brought him up there to jam with us and he was you know it was like oh man this, he's great for especially to be 14 or 15 years old his dad was like hey well we want to put something together for Kenny. We, you know, this, this is our goal. And that's how it happened. And I saw, I was, of course, open-minded to all that. I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll come jam. And, you know, we became friends and started playing. And, and, and that's, that's how the, the ball got rolling. So and you it, guys kind of like built the, the band together. What was your, what was your role in the band? My role was, was playing keyboards, anything, you know, and, and singing backup, but, but I actually played on the records um, David Z was our first producer who produced Prince and nice. Fine Young Cannibals. And so what was that experience like going into the studio? For Man, the first time? it was amazing. And mm. Kenny was still in high school, so we could only do it on the weekends. Oh, wow. So I'd drive down from MTSU. What, I, what I'd do, I'd cut class on like, I'd leave like on a Thursday and they put us up at the, the Peabody and I'd stay and do as much as I could. It would track. Because we tracked with with Chris Layton and Tommy Shannon, we tracked with uh, uh, Steve Potts played. So going into a, a professional studio environment like that for the first time, what are what were some of like the eye opening things that that you learned? What you're playing is magnified, and you don't have to overplay. Just vibe and groove on on and listen to whatever uh, everybody else is doing. I love to be fearless in the studio. If you go for something, if you and and all you got all you got to do really is. Get it right once, <laughs> you uh, know, you know, if you're scared to do that, then it's never going to, you know, you got to kind of get through that. And at the same time, you don't want to chase something that's not working for wh what you're doing. Yeah. So what led you to Nashville? The, Murphy Sproul got me 
here, made some contacts. That's where I met, you know, through through Kenny. I did an intern with Giant Records that Irving Azoff got me with James Stroud because they knew I was doing the Kenny Wayne Shepherd project. And this is right during, right after they signed Kenny to Giant Records. In your case, because it's an interesting um, topic to think about the value of college when you want to be a professional musician. Yeah. There's the networking and the meeting people and the building that, you know, kind of community and kind of coming up together. But then there's the idea that you're spending a lot of time not, actually working and getting the actual experience that's going to lead to doing that. And so I find that with a, with a, with a lot of folks, they didn't never completed college because they realized, well, I'm, I'm already able to start doing what I need to be doing. This degree isn't going to, you know, really, really help me get that, get there. And it's interesting how many of the players that we've interviewed are people that maybe started in a program for a short period of time, but never, Mm -hmm. you know, completed it and stuff. I didn't finish. So you found that, that it, that it was helpful to be in that environment as far as meeting some folks and kind of getting some roots happening. But then you also recognized if I make the effort to go out and, you know, get, get some gigs and, you know, and work and and utilize those connections that I'm making in in those, those early stages of college that really completing it wasn't going to give you any bigger advantage. No, that's true. I left the MTSU before getting my degree from that school because we started our tour. We The record was complete. It was go time. It was about early 1995. You know, we, we had some, the, the label got us some, some cool gigs and we started doing the, the, the suburban pull a trailer run. We did uh-huh. that for a while. And then the next thing you know, Irving had us opening for the Eagles, like in Europe. For, wow. And that was 96. But so I came to a go time where I had to leave. I just left MTSU. I did go back and get my degree for five years later when I had a break in the summer. Mm-hmm. And I did that for my parents because my parents were like, you know, they were both school teachers and, and they didn't. And you know, I think my mom has a diploma. I don't even have it. And I was like, here you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, man, at some point you have to you have to make that decision. You got to do the real thing. Because studying about it, and when you have the opportunity to do it, you just got to do it. And so you had to get out and network. You had to go play gigs, even crappy gigs. Even, you know, I had to play. I played at Gentleman Gyms in Murfreesboro. You know, I played everywhere I could. And because that was my, that was how you network. Having a family environment where there's not necessarily someone in your family that's a professional musician or your parents have kind of typical, you know, blue collar jobs. Yeah. It can be challenging for a lot of players when they're trying to follow this passion that they have and turn it into a career when the people around them don't really understand it as a career. They kind of see it as like, oh, well, you know, musicians are kind of the, you know, this is a hobby. For some musicians, they sort of had that, you know, support of just, you know, go out and do it. Others have the support, like we want to support you as your, as, as our child, but at the same time, they feel a bit uncomfortable about, you know, not having that sort of yeah. backup plan. Was there any sort of lesson that you learned in 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 sort of dealing with the the parents idea where they are supportive of you but at the same time sort of a little cautious or concerned about whether or not it's possible to really make a living doing that and it's exactly what you said my parents did not have a clue they didn't even know if i was good because they don't know what that looks like that first semester of college i did not want to be in college i didn't i did not want to go to college i wanted to be playing every night but that's not what happened. What happened was, is I had to basically humble myself and come to my parents and, and basically tell them, I mean, I think I was probably, I was, I had gotten really depressed and I think I was in tears and, Hey, I can't do that. What, what you want me to do right now is killing me. And I pleaded with them. I woke them up in the middle of the night and said, I'm going to, I have to do it this way. You know, I don't want to let you down, but I'm, I'm, my soul is withering and dying right now. Not to sound dramatic, but that's how it was for me. Right. And they're the ones who, who said, okay, well, then we got to find an alternative. They wanted me to have the, the fallback thing, right. which personally I was like, well, I'm not going to give up, you know, yeah, it's but not they an don't, you do have to fight for that for yourself. You know, I'm proud of myself for doing that because I could have easily just stayed in the people pleasing mode and, and been like, well, they're right, you know, and, and listen, you don't gain anything unless you take a risk. So what was, what was kind of the next tier in, in your career? I mean, I was gone and we toured all the time. We did tours with Bob Dylan, Aerosmith, Van Halen, the Eagles, BB King, 
Allman Brothers, Leonard Skinner. And, and I had a lot of touring under my belt in that small time. And, um, and I got to a place where, you know, I had to prove to myself and may possibly to everyone else that, Hey, I'm not just good at th- doing this. I, I'm actually can can do other things. That was tough because right. I left something that was successful. I uh, ended up going back to Shreveport and and working for these guys who owned who built this. They had this restaurant. I ended up being like the piano guy for a couple years. <laughs> like right. I was like like what Billy Joel did. You know, right. I was the that guy, and it was great because I was writing songs. I was I got my vocals up. I had to sing, and and I had a great gig. And and I only did that for a couple of years, and then I ended up be, coming back to Nashville, and then that sort of set the 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 wheels in motion. You had this experience of like really massive success in the early stages of your yeah. career, and then we're experiencing this feeling of like oh, maybe I'm maybe this isn't the thing for me. What was it about where where you were at that that made you think that maybe it wasn't the session thing in Nashville at the time was very locked in. You know, it was hard to to break into that they didn't really care if i played on any you know records that were nominated for grammys those first two records you know went platinum and i played on a lot of stuff but nobody, nobody cared here you know uh, i had a couple friends who were playing with this country artist a guy named chris cagle he offered me to gig and i only had a day pretty much to 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 think about it but i did it i went for it and basically the tour bus came by and the bus pulled on a trailer, came to my house, picked up my Hammond B3. And that was it. I hit the road and and got an apartment in Nashville. And, and that got me back in Nashville in the sessions and, and mm-hmm. kind of really open. But because I was here and I was committed to being here. There's mm-hmm. definitely a balance between following the gigs as the opportunities come up and then making a clear decision of like, this is where I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to do. And I've found that with a lot of players, their journey was they got those experiences through kind of just following whatever was available. But then at a certain point, had to make a conscious decision about this is the deal. And then that sometimes meant that they had to turn some things down, uh, which is a challenging thing to do. But then once once you sort of do that and you make that commitment, it seems like it it really opened up the door for, for most people to then to rise to that, you know, sort of next level with things. Once you made that commitment to to be here, how did how did the session work start? Kind of coming well, in? yeah, you're exactly right, man. It it, it uh, once you made that commitment, you, you're like, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is who I am. I, at that time, I wasn't on the road all the time, so I was home, and I would go, you know, I would play gigs and go to Family Wash, and some of it was just stuff doing for fun because I was available to do it. I would get calls and things from people just seeing me play live to come play on the record. Getting heavy into like the Nashville session scene, was there anything that you, that you sort of learned about that process or that, well, that was different than the first experience that you had had yeah, where it's really like yeah, an artist project and you have all that yeah, freedom? Yeah, def- definitely what was different was you kind of start doing the, some demos and things and, and you're on a time crunch. And, and, and it's a lot of pressure. It taught me to focus on what I was doing and get it right quick mm-hmm. and, and and think about other parts that I'm going to play later. So that did kind of, and I was good at that. I didn't know that I would be good at that. You so know? you feel like you were, you were naturally good at that off the bat or, or looking back where there's some things that like you got thrown into one of those sessions for the first time and then you left that day and said, I probably need to work on X, Y, Z to be able to do this better. When someone was in there like, kind of, you know, looking at their watch and say, okay, God, we got to get, you know, we got to go on the next song and, you know, be great now. I don't know how, I don't know why. Instead of collapsing, I, I, I grew, I was better at it. I was like, oh, okay, fine. Watch this. You know, like I uh-huh. had that attitude and, and, um, it worked for me and that helped me to, to start thinking consciously about laying down the parts and like, putting on the different hats, which, you know, guitar players have to do this all day long in Nashville. Yeah. It, it, it was the demos that were the hardest. The, the the actual records with master session stuff were like so much easier. There's more time. And, there's more time. Yeah. And there's, so do, do you feel like the, the, the demo stuff uh, is helpful in allowing you to execute those master things better? Or do you look at them as being just kind of like two different things? I, I do think they help. They're definitely two different things, too flexing two different muscles that stuff does help you also be a better player in press high pressure situations 
especially if you're doing a, a late night or a TV show or something, and then you're you, you something happens and you lose audio or something or or part. You know, you got to be able to do this if if things go awry or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or, or do you remember any challenges that came in the early days of those those higher pressure you know d- demo factory situations? <laughs> yeah, the challenges for me was like I've got I've got a writer who wrote a song that's not that great. I can do some awesome shit on here. I don't know that it's going to help what you're what you want it to do. Instead of having being negative about that, I would I would try to now what I do is offer some you know say hey here's what we could do we could change this chord to here and it'll flow a little better it's a good thing to discuss because the you know the idea of being one of the you know go-to session players and, and live players in a town like Nashville is that everything you work on is awesome and it's always great music and you know and the the reality is you know there's there's plenty of things that just are subjectively you know yeah. and sometimes not subjectively you know yeah. not that great where, where did you sort of personally find the ability to kind of not let it make you jaded when you're kind of stuck knowing that, you know, for a period of time here, I may be playing on demo session type things where the music isn't that great. It may not be that inspiring. How do you stay creatively fulfilled and okay about that? Knowing that it's eventually, you know, you're getting to that point where most of what you're working on is, is going to be great and you are going to be excited about. The challenging part about some of that was we all like, I'm a writer, you're a writer. We all, you know, everybody in Nashville, can write a pretty good song, but we all write bad songs too. <laughs> you know, it's like, we all have that. What what was challenging for me during that time was like to have a writer who, who might've had a little bit of an attitude or thought the song was the song. And it's just like, not, not what they thought it was. And then having to navigate that. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was hard for me at first because I would feel the pressure because as I wanted to please them, I wanted them to be happy with it, but, but they would take out their frustration. They're not getting what they want on the band when the band's killing it. But now after having those experiences, instead of letting that fluster you or, or, or create a problem, you, you try to help them create what their, their goal. And the difference is someone who's like a, a doctor or, or like, and they want to make a record, they're usually going to come in pretty humble. They're going to be like, hey, you know, I don't know. I'm open to suggestions because the guys that are in there are do that every day and they can help. Right. You know, it's harder when there's somebody who's not willing to, to listen. That can happen quite a bit, um, regardless of sort of, you know, level, but where a writer has a perception about what they wanted a song to be, but it just from a third party perspective, you know, seeing it, it's like, it's just not exactly, I know what you're saying, but that, but this, that doesn't exist, you know, yeah. within this song. Um, and what I hear you saying is that in those scenarios, rather than being focused on the fact that, that, that fact in particular, you you start trying to zoom out a bit and find, okay, well, what can we do to provide a solution in this situation? Exactly. Rather than focusing on the problem. Exactly. In, in your chair, how much have you dove into the non-organic instrument, you know, non-piano Rhodes uh, organ thing with synths and, and having all of those sounds? Where how, how have you found to, to manage evolution of the, the chair of piano player, or keyboard player in, in a session? Man, I love playing synth stuff. That's like, which, you know, my, my passion's always been Hammond B3, PM, uh, you know, train on the piano. But I love all the, you know, I'm a vintage, I love all the old school you know, clavs, whirlies, roads. I've always loved, had a special place in my heart for, for the synth stuff, especially like the early 80s kind of new wave stuff. And I'm using them more and more on sessions like with Parker McCollum. I use a synth and an organ together. It's an OB6. It's that synth that Jim Oberheim and Dave Smith built together, like a prophet combined with the, the OBX, which was the jump Van Halen jump keyboard. I usually track with the B3 first. I start out with a, a just a really warm kind of tone. Try not to turn the Leslie on too much. Build that first. And then I usually go back and add the synth. On the organ, I would, I would play it more like it was organ guy, a very smooth kind of take. But then the synth thing, I will uh, it 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 will not be the same chords. It'll be, be totally different voicing. If I'm in a one register on the organ, I try to, you know, I'm like, okay, well that register's covered. Let me try something different on the on the synth. And I do use the filters a lot just to to build 
the dynamic, but I never let it get too too sizzly because when people hear that, they're they are gonna think it's too much like a synth. Yeah, like too much like a synth, or, right. or like you know they think of jump or something. You know, yeah. there's a very like nuanced approach to to what sounds hip and like in modern, and then what will immediately like date something and something like a filter, like taking that uh, sizzliness out of the top end, w- can definitely do that you know rounding it out helping it kind of like hide in the track a little bit more so you hear it and there's the texture of it but it's not as like upfront as if it was like an 80s like dance track or something yeah exactly to fit into the to that space what are the considerations that are going through your head as it relates to the track as a whole and the part that you're playing it really depends on what's happening with the guitars i think about where where their tones are like and what effects they're using and how I can kind of play do contrast that. If there is a a, a lot of delay going on with a guitar, you know, then I'm gonna I'm not gonna use delay. <laughs> or, or if there's vibrato going on, you know, I, I don't want to do that because it's already being being done. So when you're listening to a track, what are some of the things that you're sort of discerning about? How much is my role to? stand out and make a statement and a sound that has a really clear identity versus supporting uh, what's there. Sometimes I'll just go for stuff and like wait for them to tell me no. I used to not be that way. I used to be a little bit more safe with that. But at this point, I feel like, hey, I'm here for a reason. So I'm going to be myself with it. Well, the idea of remembering that you're there for a reason, I think is a big part of that, you know, that that confidence factor. Because there's this balance between delivering something that is safe and that you know will work and then deciding when is when are the right times to you know step out and try something fresh and if you don't ever try those things then you're kind of limiting the impact that you can have and i think in the early stages for a lot of players they, they want to play it safe because they're just excited to be there they don't want to screw anything up but then oftentimes it's that realization that i got hired for this session for me because someone told them I'm going to be good for this because of what I do. So then once you recognize that and you have that, now you're, you're able to do your job even better and probably make a better impression because you feel like you have the freedom to do you. I usually turn down things where I think they're like, insert keyboard player here. You know, especially uh, on a tour or something, you know, I always, that's when I first consider, do they want me or do they want just a guy playing a couple notes here and there mm-hmm. and that makes a difference to me because because then i'm high, i'm i'm there because i'm allowed to be me why in the other situation i've got to be whatever they want me to be and i gotta work we all gotta work and and do things and there's always there's always things that you may do and you're like yeah i don't know you know i'm gonna do it but uh, and, so the the challenge is that for a certain period of time, th- for many people, it's not possible. No, it's not because you got it because they don't know you, they don't know who you are, what you do, and also you need the work to pay. You bills. need the work, but you also, I guess, that's what I'm saying. Like as a musician, don't be scared to go out there and give them something of y- yourself musically. That and that's the that's the danger in playing it safe all the time. It is that you might just end up being this safe guy. And it doesn't allow you to be who you are, but that's tricky because like you said, you know, we all, we have to work and you also, you want to be a team player. Yeah. So it sounds like it's really about finding a balance and, it's, and reading the is. room that you're in and it seeing is. how much space you have for that. Totally, man. Totally. But I think it's a great point. If your goals are, a high, you know, continuing to grow and, you know, getting to a higher level, that's probably not going to happen if you're just strictly the people pleasing, I'm going to only do what I know absolutely will work and never take risk, you know, sort of thing. Yes. Then you get stuck in being that sort of insert keyboard player here for gig thing, as opposed to the people chasing you down because of what you have determined is, you know, is that kind of identity. What's your take on like presets versus like building stuff, you know, from, from scratch? How do you prepare to be able to, someone says, hey, I want X, Y, Z for this pass. And then you're able to pull that up pretty quickly and, you know, and get there. I, I think for me, it's knowing my board. I go through the board. I hit the the, the basic patches that are might be preset and know and, and do remember where they are. And then I can edit 
find a basic patch like okay this is a warm pad but i know if i do this and that i can brighten it or i can make it small or i can use the filter and change it so it's more about having like a starting point I, yeah you gotta have a starting point because somewhere. you don't know then you will get flustered you mm -hmm. know i don't care how where you are if you don't know where to start and you're like oh shoot, where where was that sound right. yeah you're gonna end up killing some time you know and i don't want to do that so i usually am am organized enough where i know where that is so you played with the wallflowers for a while though. yes how did that gig come about my buddy Stuart mathis who's a great guitar player i had been playing with gavin DeGraw on the road for a couple years and the next thing i know Stuart had called me and was wanting to know, hey, what what are you doing right now? And I was like, well, funny, I'm not, I'm I'm just kind of came off the road, you know, and that's how it happened. And and basically, I flew out to L.A. and we did a rehearsal at his manager's house by the pool outside. I had, had basically come in and replaced Rami because Rami was um, doing Foo Fighter stuff, and I was supposed to be out there for several days, and we only ended up after the rehearsal. He was like, wow, okay, we're good. <laughs> so coming into a, a situation where you're replacing a key member of the of the band what sort of challenges come in with um with coming into a a band situation where there's specific parts that are there and you kind of have to how much of that did you did you have to make sure that you were staying true yeah. to something i mean rami always played great parts on the songs so that was it was pretty easy when that gig because of that when it came to like some of the other like piano stuff and things i, I mean I'm, I'm a huge like nicky hopkins fan and that's kind of what i try to do piano wise is, is add that element which jacob loved that you know surprisingly enough jacob wasn't like no you gotta play i mean he kind of like man dude do you don't have to play that part if you don't want to so going into a rehearsal for that, did you kind of prepare with that in mind of, of needing to do what they did and then you got more comfortable as it a as you got into the thing? Absolutely. I had to be prepared for both. I'd heard those, the, at least the first couple of records, you know, I, I knew a lot of the, the stuff. I wanted to see it and I charted, charted it out. You should be prepared for all of it because you might take the charts and just throw them out the window and once you get up there, you might not need them. They might change the whole arrangement. I do that for me because I can go in there and say, well, I did the best that I could. And I, I you know, and that makes me, gives me confidence and makes me feel good about myself as a professional. Some people might not. Some people might just go over the songs over and over and never make a note. And they just make it mentally, which is smart too, you know, because that way it's there. You're not, you don't need it on a piece of paper. I wasn't looking at paper i mean when we did a rehearsal there's no chart or anything from i did that all beforehand so i can like when i'm i can visualize a, a piece in the song because i went over it before with the chart and, and and i can have the numbers kind of flashing through my head when i get to that part that's just for my process you yeah, know everybody's gotcha. is different so either way preparation is required what you're saying is there's different ways to prepare yes Absolutely, because what works for me may not work for someone else. So a career in this industry can is, is usually a roller coaster ride for everybody, and in some cases that's a long way up, and you stay up for a while, and then you know maybe sl slow kind of decline down. There's varying degrees of the up and down. It, it, in your career, has there been any moments that you remember that were really good lessons to pull away from that helped you learn how to manage? the fact that that's going to happen in some form for everyone. It is a roller coaster ride. And, you know, you've got to kind of learn how to manage your money to know when it's like, okay, I'm not going to make much money in their scene, so I need to put this back. And you can also take a slow season and be super creative. Like after that first tour I did with Gavin, I did not do another tour with him for a couple of years. And I didn't have a lot going on in town. I mean, I had sessions here and there, but not, but I ended up writing a record and doing my own record. And it turned out to be an awesome, you know, it was very creative and I was very proud of that. You know, it's not like I made a ton of money on it or anything, but it opened other doors. And I did these demos at my house. So it didn't cost me any money. It just cost me time and energy to write them. And I wrote these songs about, um, in the point of view, the Peanuts characters. So I, I did a couple, wrote a couple songs and I remember posting the demos and there happened to be a, a guy, this guy named Bruce Brimmer, who who lived in California. He was a school teacher, and but he he had money for projects and things that he thought were cool. He basically reached out, came to Nashville. He budgeted me. I did a whole record, and we were partners on it. Uh, he funded it. 
And I, I would have never guessed that would, would have happened in a million years, you know, right. and it did. It wasn't a calculated thing at all. <laughs> no. It was just, you had some time, you dove into something to fulfill your creative spirit and the universe worked out what it needed to work out. Yeah. And I feel like it's a great example of when we're in a challenging season in our, our career, we're coming down for a moment before we're rising back up on that roller coaster to just take a moment to put your energy into something that's going to fill you up creatively and just trust that by continuing to be creative and, you know, move towards it, hopefully in, in most cases, it'll help open up an opportunity or just kind of keep you flourishing creatively. Yeah, absolutely. You just never know. We all have moments like in our life or our career where you're just thinking, wow, am I relevant or what? I think it's important to, for one, to remember why you're doing what you're doing. I think if your motives are pure, then it's it's always going to be a good thing. And you might just be in a place where you don't want to be creative. You just want to relax and and do some, you know, and that's cool too. Have you kind of defined what success is for you? Like what makes you feel successful? I think for me, success is growth, challenging yourself, something that where you might be out of your comfort zone. That's hard because we all are going to fear a little bit of a uh, fear of failure. I don't feel like success is, is a, for me, is not a monetary thing. For me, success is being able to have a record of who you are. You know, you can go back and say, hey, well, that represents, that's me. That represents me. I guess it's also knowing your worth to your value. Musicians can, can sometimes get used up by other people. You know, I couldn't feel good about myself if I agreed to do something and wasn't happy doing it or wasn't being paid what I was supposed to be making. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, I think that all kind of rolls into um, being successful and feeling successful. So feeling successful for you and, and you believe has a lot to do with the self-worth and valuing yourself to a point yeah. where you have the confidence to choose the work to do, to, to not to do, make sure that, that you're treated well. Also being humble and it's it's that whole understanding of, of it's not just about the the big gig and if that big gig isn't something that's filling you up. For someone that's trying to break into the indus industry now, as, as you're able to be been in here long enough to see the aspects of on the road, in the studio, that sort of thing, what sort of advice would you give to somebody if you're sitting down for coffee and they're saying, well, what's what's my next step? What do I do? Are you doing this because you want to be a better musician or do you want more uh, followers on Instagram? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's actually, if you want to be famous, you want to be great, great, go be famous. But usually you, you become famous because you, you've achieved something not just for the sake of being famous. But as a musician, you, that your motive should be like, I wanna, I wanna make music, I wanna create, I wanna be the best player I can be. I wanna be a good person. Look at what you're w willing to work for money-wise and what you're not willing to do, you know, because you do have to fight a little bit. No management ever is gonna just offer you the best deal at front. You're like, hey, you're cool with 50 bucks. You gotta say, yeah, no, I'm not. How about, how about 200? <laughs> you know, you got you got to be able to stand up for yourself, and but you also don't want to lose gigs for that. So, I mean, there are time things where I've done gigs where you know the money wasn't great at all, but the person I was playing with was great. You know, you got to look at dollars versus soul dollars too, because you may not make a lot of physical dollars, but you might get soul dollars might be a fool. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me. I think this is an incredible episode. I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me.